welcome everyone. Um, this is the uh, book launch, the official book launch of uh, The Grief Hole by Karen Warren. And uh, very, very proud. I'm Jerry Huntman, for those of you who don't know me. I know a lot of faces though, which is really fantastic. But um, I'm the publisher and I'm the managing director of IFWG Publishing Australia. Um, I'll, before I start talking a little bit about the uh, publishing experience, uh, which I think is a, a worthwhile story to tell, um, I'll just want to give a few administrative things to you. Uh, first of all, um, this isn't just the uh, book launch, this is also the official uh, uh, release date for the uh, cloth bound version of uh, the Grief Hall. And in a month from now, we'll be releasing the trade paperback. However, for the book launch, um, I've uh, managed a couple of uh, book runs for both editions and they are available in the bookshop. Uh, for those of you who wish to purchase. And at the end of this book launch, uh, as you get ushered out, um, there will be a nice little spot for uh, Karen to sign your books if you wish them to be signed. And also for, and hands up please, Keely. Hands up. Uh, she's the illustrator uh, of the book as well as the cover designer. And um, uh, I hope that she's there to also uh, be there for some signatures if she wants to. <laughs> um, just for uh, just for interest, by the way, uh, throughout this time, as also including during the break, uh, Keely's going to be doing some sketching, and uh, at the uh, at the end of the launch, uh, we'll just maybe some randomly hand out a few. I don't think I'm going to use a lottery or anything. We'll just randomly hand out. It's going to be very famous very soon, so make sure you copies. That's right. So yes, put it in plastic straight away. <laughs> So uh, that's, that's enough for the moment uh, with regards to the administration. Uh, I'll talk a bit more later on a few other things. Um, IFWG uh, has always wanted to have dark, uh, adult dark fiction in its catalogue. Uh, it's partly because I'm the owner of the company and I like dark fiction. <laughs> so uh, that's part of the reason. But um, uh, it's, a, it's a, a type of fiction that uh, has a legitimate place in the uh, genre spectrum and uh, we certainly wanted to include that. Uh, the first cab off the rank was a couple of years ago when Robert Hood, uh, uh, when we published his collection of short stories, uh, of ghost stories, his complete collection. It was a massive tome, over 800 pages. It was a big project, and it was something that I absolutely loved and adored doing. And, uh, and it's an award winner. Uh, now, uh, while we did that production, we decided we would also have a, uh, a discrete uh, title series, and we called it Dark Phases. The criteria for that was that the uh, author had to be internationally respected and known, and also the work that was being published had to be original, or in the case of a collection, some original content, um, uh, and the work really had to represent that respect. In other words, had to be some of the best of that author. And uh, um, Robert's uh, qualified on both accounts. Um, and so that was a great way of starting that series. We always thought of that series as being uh, irregular and, uh, and certainly uh, not uh, in any way uh, a quick turnover. Uh, we, were, we wanted to have the perfect wave each time we wanted to publish a book in that series. But guess what? Murphy's Law comes in six months or so later. <laughs> we have a conversation. And so number two came out. Um, now, now, Sorry, I love that sandwich. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> uh, and I, 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 my, my words soon will show that. Um, the, um, well, actually, my, words, my next words will say that. Uh, Karen is uh, perfectly suited for that series. Uh, she is uh, respected worldwide in the, in the speculative fiction field. Uh, she's a, a shortlisted in the World Fantasy Awards, recipient of the Shirley Jackson Award, which is a prestigious award. Uh, she has novels already behind her and collections behind her that have been um, given great praise by critics. And um, certainly I've been a fan for, for many years. Uh, so, uh, perfect match for the series. And of course, uh, well, the other qualification was, was that the work had to be one of the best works. And um, uh, I am biased. Sorry, my advice, but I think that this is probably the best novel uh, to date, or if not, up there. So, um, the 
real question then is, what, why is a small independent publisher based in the suburbs of Melbourne publishing someone of such renown? Uh, and um, uh, you, you can chime in if you want to. But uh, uh, in, 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 early, in early discussions that I had uh, with, with, with Karen when we started talking about the project, um, I sort of distilled two reasons, I think, why she wanted to come to us. Like I said, you can correct me. Uh, the first is that uh, I believe you were, you bore witness to the publishing process with, uh, with Robert. Uh, we, we, we pride ourselves in working very closely with authors, trying to get the creativity to bubble up in many different ways. And also, at the same time, we also um, uh, uh, really believe in, in, in providing high quality as much as we can. And, and, and it turned into a magical product, I think. And I think you may have noticed that. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Quality looks and content. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, the second reason, maybe, is more telling. Um, in, 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 it is my belief that in the industry, uh, the one uh, aspect of being a small publisher that is well and truly better than being a, a, a larger publisher is that you can take chances, you can take risks, you can do things that the, the others are shying away from. And it, a lot of it has to do with, I think, book sales, book numbers. So there are genres that they, they don't touch, uh, there's poetry they don't touch much, there are even anthologies and collections they don't touch much. It's all those sorts of things. And uh, being a small publisher, if you, if you really believe in producing a quality product and you see a quality manuscript, the idea is, is to shove ahead, even if it doesn't mean huge sales. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that the grief hole will have not have huge sales, but, but uh, but nevertheless, that's, that's the, the no, philosophy. Number two is it's not going to sell, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this was not part of the idea. Um, anyway, um, a, a, a little bit more seriously, um, one little element that, uh, that pub, larger publishers also shy away from are uh, difficult topics, difficult subjects. Uh, I'm not saying they, they all don't do it, but they don't do it very often. And The Grief Hole is a book that covers very difficult and sensitive topics. Uh, I won't go a lot into it because I think others can talk about that in this launch. But what I can say is, is that uh, we certainly were driven to, to wanting to publish this because it covered, um, an, uh, it, it revealed the dark side of society, the dark side of people's souls, and covered really, really tough topics like domestic violence and youth suicide. So I won't say more than that. I may have said too much. Right? <laughs> um, the, um, what was interesting was, was that when in our early discussions, uh, at one point, uh, Karen asked me to read the manuscript before we would continue, and, uh, and also my submission readers. And the reason why was, I think she stated, was that um, you know, I want you to read it before you can, uh, so that you can tell us if you're comfortable in doing it. So that gives you an idea of that sort of level of discussion that we had. Now, by the way, when, when we finished that meeting, I walked away and I thought, it's Karen Warren. Mm -hmm. Anything that she writes about is going to be right written well. I mean, that just made me want to publish it more before I even read it. Uh, and, 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 and by the way, that came to, to fruition. I read it and was blown away. So were my submission readers so in England and in the US. So um, that's in relation to the, the early discussion. The, I just wanted to add one more thing, and that is I want to give a few acknowledgements, and this is really important. Uh, as a publisher, when you publish a book, uh, you form a team. Uh, and that team uh, will work together. Sometimes they, there'll be a little bit of you know, thought and concepts and a little bit of discussion and what have you. It's never perfect. The uh, team worked beautifully, smoothly. Uh, more creativity came out. They were better than the sum of their parts. I assigned my uh, most senior and experienced editor to this, Sophie Yorkston, who's based in Melbourne. I have to, uh, she apologised for coming here. She really wanted to come here, but she couldn't. But uh, I can honestly say that uh, all I heard was just praise coming from her. So that's, that helps a lot. And then finally, and uh, not the least, uh, is Keeley. Um, what happened was I met Keeley a couple of years ago in Canberra, uh, loved her art, and I knew that that sort of style and everything was going to fit somewhere, but I, don't, I didn't know where. So when I read the manuscript and started thinking about illustrations and the, uh, 
that phases line needs to have illustrations in it, you know, at least half a dozen or so. Um, uh, I immediately uh, thought of Keeley and I uh, added her to a very small short list, handed over to Karen. I think you pretty quickly agreed that that was the style that was needed. Yes. It was perfect. Um, all I can say is that she uh, performed above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, we required six, seven illustrations, including the signing sheet, uh, also the artwork for the cover. Uh, it turns out that she was a trained designer, so she did the designs of the cover as well, so that's a nice uh, bonus. Um, but she also produced variations, mood illustrations, um, uh, additions, options, to the point where um, we said, uh, this is crazy, uh, they're all good, so we picked the best, but um, we're actually going to be publishing a uh, limited run hardcover uh, art portfolio of Keeley's work as a companion to this book, 75 pages long. Uh, that will include uh, artist's journey notes and also appropriately positioned excerpts from the book as well. So uh, I'm not being a salesman, but in about a month or so we're going to release <laughs> So anyway, look, I've, I've said enough. I, I, I just wanted to give you a bit of an idea of the journey. It was a really beautiful journey, um, and uh, we're very moved by uh, all of this. I'm delighted by the number of people here, and uh, I'm also uh, delighted to now introduce Karen. Thank you, Gary. And all of what he said is true about the relationship, certainly. Early on, I uh, loved, loved Rob's book and was just so impressed with it. And from any conversation I've ever had with Jerry about the processes of printing, I was just impressed by uh, how sensible he was, but also how passionate. So it's pretty amazing to bring those two things together. He's a really good businessman, at the same time as a passionate reader and publisher. And that's quite a remarkable thing, I think, to find. And, my, and with Keely, we had the most amazing um, experience. I suppose she really engaged with the book. So it wasn't just like she was illustrating things that I had asked her to illustrate. She really engaged with it. And we had this moment where we were sitting having coffee and she'd done these illustrations that I thought were wonderful, but she wasn't happy with, that weren't there yet. And so I just said, how about, forget about all that I asked you for, because I'd asked you for lots of things, put this symbol in, and a black hole, and this and that, and about five different elements that I wanted in each picture, which she, I thought she'd done beautifully, but she felt wasn't working. So I just said, you just do what you want to do, and engage with it, and that's what we ended up with, these incredibly deep and amazing illustrations. So, yes. So maybe it, you really should fight, when she's at the end, fight for these pictures, because she's so clever. Um, this piece of artwork here is the map um, of the grief hole. The grief hole is a place as well as a symbolic thing. Uh, it was in, the, the place itself was inspired when we were in Montreal in I think, 2009. And I saw this old building with half the side sheared off. You know, you see those amazing things and there's just the, the memory of what used to be there. So there was a memory of a door and the memory of a window there. And it just struck me so powerfully. This is this forgotten building with just these spaces that used to be. Uh, and so I just envisaged this place that I could then call the grief hole, which is where young people are drawn to, to commit suicide. Um, and this is the map that my main character, Teresa, finds scrawled in an office. It's actually her uncle's stamp company, which is why I'm in the end. I've got up here some little badges that my daughter made with old stamps on them. Little badges. Make sure you all come and get one of those because um, they're yes, inspired by this stamp company that she works with. And she finds in the photocopy room this map scrawled uh, on a ledger. And part of the story is her finding out what the map is, where it leads to. And her cousin actually had committed suicide and so it's finding out what happened to her cousin as well. Um, so yeah, so it is a very dark story, but I think there is some elements of hope in there. There's certainly elements of love and the importance of love amongst each other. Um, and then why it hurts so much, why grief hurts so much is because we love so much. So it's exploring some of those things. So I thought I might read you the opening and then a little bit of when she first goes into the grief hole. <clears throat> For every intervention there was aftermath, a blank space in her memory, a slowing of movement. Theresa knew this, but some monsters had to be dealt with. Many times she didn't intervene if the ghosts were quiet or their message unclear. She never acted unless she was sure. 
It was the rise of the ghosts that pushed her. When the ghosts flew so thick she could barely breathe, she had to act. The first intervention. Client A sat in the kitchen of the rented apartment Teresa had found for her. Her oldest child cooked the dinner. It's not so good, Teresa hoped they'd invite her to stay, although she'd say no to maintain the boundaries. One child was at the table doing homework, the other two watching cartoons. My husband used to manage all the finances, the rent, all that, the woman told her. I looked after the people, he looked after the things. We always did it that way. Teresa said, I lost my man too. That's an emptiness that can't be filled. We can only try. We were saving for a home, the woman said. Most of that went to medical and funeral expenses. He was going to do all the cabinet making. It would be beautiful. He wasn't a clumsy man. How could they say it was his fault? The woman spoke quietly. The children had not seen their father's body. That was an image none of them needed. <coughs> the phone rang. Mum, it's the man from the real estate. Client A sighed, and Teresa thought she caught a glimmer of something shifting in the fridge. He wants to do an inspection. Do you want me to be here? Teresa asked. No, I need to be independent. I can do it. As Client A talked, Teresa could see ghosts coming for her, crawling hand over hand, broken legs trailing behind them. The more she talked, the closer they got. And around the 15-year-old were what appeared to be teenage girls, blood pouring down their thighs. Curiosity sparked by the ghosts, Teresa waited in her car until the real estate agent arrived. Faces from every window watched as he walked up the path. Searching for information on her handheld, she found nothing but praise for his work and his dedication. But as he walked, ghosts scooted around. They knew an ally. Hurry up! Pushing him forward. Get it done! Teresa followed him for three days as he visited clients. She asked a Greet questions, took the occasional photo. When even a 48-year-old bike, his widow was surrounded by beaten ghosts after he visited her, she knew this man was a destroyer, perhaps one who preyed on widows. Can I help you, love? She heard, a gentle, masculine voice. A man dressed in leathers, long beard, tattoos. He held a cigarette between two yellowed fingers and incongruously balloons tied to the handles of his motorbike. Oh, she said. It's just that you're staring in at my mate's wife. My mate's dead, so we're watching out for her, and she's not keen on being stared in at. Teresa thought, am I going to do this? The real estate agent left the house, wiping his mouth. The woman's ghosts leapt up and down, broken legs buckling, trampolining their excitement, and she knew she had to intervene. It's that man. I've been following him, and I've seen some terrible things. The real estate agent fought back. He was strong and wiry, but he was never going to win. Teresa was there to watch. If they expected her to call a halt, they were surprised. She didn't regret the intervention, but she physically reacted to it, coming out in boils. She wondered it worth the aftermath. She, sorry, she considered it worth the aftermath because of the solace it brought her, and because when next she visited Client A, there were no ghosts to be seen. Even after five years working at the refuge, barely a morning dawned when Teresa didn't wait thinking of who she would help that day. When asked why she did it, why she made such sacrifices for others, she said, I just want to help. But truthfully, helping others helped her to forget, distracted her from her empty life, made her feel good. She listened well, mostly because she didn't want to talk about herself, and she had an extra skill. She could see the ghosts of beaten women around the clients who had died. Teresa did what she could for her clients, and sometimes the ghosts would vanish. More often, though, they'd be replaced by others. The ones beaten with a baseball bat would replace the ones drowned in a bathtub, or the ones kicked to death would replace the ones gutted. It was exhausting, depressing, and emotionally draining. So many times she wanted to say, go, you don't need to be a victim, leave, find a new life. But she knew that couldn't work, that it was a letter to the editor opinion, and she'd help no one by expressing it. All she could do was watch the ghosts, help house the clients, and sometimes, if it was called for, intervene. So many times she didn't intervene, and most often she knew this was right. Other times she made small choices, small changes, and hoped these were enough. Then her inaction led to the death of a client. little bit 
and then we might have a break and got some champagne. <laughs> <laughs> and Sammy doesn't, I've made these uh, chocolate chip cookies, these little Greek holes on the top. <laughs> 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 so this is just the first little part when Teresa uh, has found out what the Greek hole is and has been taken there. And this is just her uh, when she when she goes in. She climbed through. It was very bright, which made the shadow sharp. She stood at the end of a long corridor, wide and airy. She started to head for the stairs she could see at the other end. There were some doors wide open along one side, leading to small apartments the size of hotel rooms. Some had stone figures in the bed, unmoving. There were many closed doors. She saw thin ghosts sliding in and out of one door and she thought, is someone starving to death in there? She didn't think this could be possible. There was a massive mu mural, not a mural, <laughs> a mural running along the full length of one wall. Professionally painted, it was so realistic, Teresa reached out and touched one gaunt face, almost expecting it to be warm. It showed a queue of people, children squatting, adults weeping, waiting. One little girl had torn, stripy leggings. One of the women was tall and stooped, as if she was trying to make herself shrink. At the head of the queue, near the end of the hallway, the artist had painted a man who held out one small apple to the mother of the front. His face looked kindly, hers filled with despair, as if she knew that she and her children would be dead before they reached the front of the queue again. He had a sunny aureole painted around his head. He was so much the hero of the picture, Teresa took out her phone and snapped a photo of him. Maybe it's a magic apple, like the magic pudding. You bite and eat and it's never finished, Teresa thought but she knew it wasn't. She thought of Amber's drawing, how she depicted this wall, blurry, unclear, as if she had squeezed her eyes closed as she passed it. At the end of the hallway, a hole had been knocked in the wall. Teresa climbed through it. She walked through rooms and holes until she reached a small, green painted room, the walls outside covered with names and dates. As she entered, she felt as though all sound was numbed, as if she sat in the eye of a storm. It's not dry and stagnant, like a museum, with an underlying odour of old sweat or old plastic. The room was full of the detritus they left behind them. Empty water and soft drink bottles, empty wine bottles, empty whiskey and gin bottles, wallets, notes, empty packets of chips. There was evidence of last meals. There were shoes. In her mind, she catalogued it, sorted it. This is where she sat. She sketched here, Teresa thought. The music was louder. The room was different to the one in Amber's sketch in small ways. There was no anchor in the corner, no rainbow on the wall, no daffodil. The walls were covered in graffiti, not even eternity or sweet paintings. No ribbons, no egg shapes, no ladybugs, no birds. There were no dead bodies either, but you could see remnants of these in stains on the floor, kick marks on the wall, and understood they really had been there. She could feel a sense of hopelessness in her. She hadn't expected to feel this way so soon. So, yeah, so that's Teresa is the main character, and she does go. The, the man depicted in that mural is Sol Evictus, who is a very charismatic singer, who Teresa discovers she needs to try to stop. <laughs> On that word, we will stop.